Football Americas is a show featuring Sebastian Salazar and former U.S. men's national team player Hercules Gomez, which airs on ESPN+, and they are doing special coverage out in Qatar during the World Cup. So I have the privilege today of being joined by both of the hosts of Football Americas, Sebastian Salazar and Hercules Gomez. Both of you, how are you guys doing today? Great, man. Great. Well. It's good to be in the uh, in the same room. We're not always in the same place, but uh, pumped for today, especially with the roster reveal and everything that's going on. Good to be in New York City. Always a little a little extra buzz here now. Always fun in New York. So injuries make this World Cup, I feel like, more uh, hard to predict. But your your outlooks on the U.S. men's national team, before we know the official roster, with a group consisting of Wales, England, and Iran, what is your expectation for the United States? Is it just to get out of the group, maybe sneak in a knockout stage win? What are your expectations for the United States uh, in Qatar? I think it's a fantastic World Cup if they get out of the group phase. I really, I really do. I think, you know, we got to look at England as a powerhouse. Iran's just not an easy team it's a talented team even if we don't know a lot about it it's going to be a tough team to beat especially if you look at their qualification record and all that you know is going to be for them on the line in a matchup against the united states i think wales is the most accessible three games like the more i see of wales um you know but even that's going to be a a, a tough game especially if gary bale does what he does (laughs) in big games in mls cup so um, I think like a one, one in one record wouldn't surprise me. And then, you know, goal difference to get out. And, and once you get to the round of 16, there's not a team in CONCACAF that unless they get a really nice matchup and because of the, the potential cross with group A, the U S could get a nice matchup. Um, especially now with the news about Sadio Mane and Senegal, I mean, group A is looking really weak. So, you know, maybe there's a chance if you get through that you get a, a decent matchup in the round of 16, but I think for the most part, the U S are going to be pretty big underdogs if they get out of the group. And I think like most CONCACAF teams, you take that fourth game and you hang that on on your banner and you say, hey, there's a good World Cup. Yeah, if you're looking at how accessible the group is, if we had to put a percentage for each CONCACAF team, the U.S. would have the biggest percentage of not only getting out of the group, but going the furthest because of that crossover Sevi was talking about. Listen, if you speak to anybody who's – who's going to tell you anything about World Cup qualifying in Europe, they would probably say the two weakest teams in Europe in World Cup qualifying were Poland and Wales. And Wales, what they – less than full strength Gareth Bale, uh, you, you would sign that if that's who you had to face. And if you had to face any version of England, you would want to face this version of England who has a lot of injury doubts at the moment and has also not won in their last six games. And, and they've only scored in two of those games of those six games. So if you had to choose, that would be it. There is a sneaky game here, and you mentioned this, Seb, which is Iran. Yeah. Iran very much reminds me of in my World Cup in 2010, you were thinking about England. And the next game was for Slovenia. Slovenia. Uh, and it ended up being the Algeria game that got you through, the most important game. They're a very sneaky opponent, uh, a very good team in Asia. They won their group in a group that had South Korea. They're going to be no slouch. It's going to be a very high-pressured game for different reasons, right? On the field, off the field, geopolitically, all, all that thing, all those things that come to uh, play. But Seb's right. The crossover is, is accessible. Qatar, Senegal. Qatar's going to be different, yep. difficult because they're a host nation. Yeah. Netherlands, uh, it, it's definitely going to be uh, a difficult task for the U.S. men's national team. Um, but getting out of the group would be success for them. Yeah, it's so it's crazy because the World Cup is so binary, right? They line in between success and absolute failure. But um, it it will be a great accomplishment, I think, if they get out of this group. And we will view it very much as a failure if they don't. That's just the reality, and so it's unfortunate for coaches. But you know, that's that's the line of work you chose. Yeah, and by the way, Seb mentioned one, one, and one. Uh, in the eyes of many, that's that's a terrible result. That's a terrible group play, right? Well, 2002, the U.S. men's national team's mm-hmm. best modern history run, where they made it to the quarterfinals, was Germany was one, one, and one. And they got routed by Poland and had to have South Korea help them out against Portugal to go on to the next round and then beat Mexico, you know, in the round of 16 to get to the quarterfinal game where this coach, Greg Berhalter, had a header off the line for some Frings handball and was a bad call away from being in a semifinal game. So success in a World Cup is so just, yeah. you know, one, one and one fine. Yeah. will get you through probably, you know, like half the time. You know, Mexico did was 1-1-1 one, one, and one in 94 and won the group, you know, right. based on goal difference. They were 1-1-1 one, one and one in uh, – 2010 as well, I believe, in South Africa. So it, it could get you through, but it, it could also no, no, not. No, no, if no. they go 1-1-1. One, no, no. One one. no, no, sir. We were 1-1-2 uh, times. No, no, Mexico. Mexico. Uh, we're uh, talking about the U.S. here. Yeah, I'm saying why, why do you want? there are teams that go 1-1-1 one, one, and, one and win groups, and there are teams that go 1-1-1 yeah. one, one, and, one and, and get left out. And, and by the way, there were teams that won two games uh, last World Cup and were left out. Kyle, to that point, let me, let me turn your question to her. 
if U.S. goes one, one, and one and doesn't get through, failure? Of course. Okay. All right. Of course. Who's just one game, still a failure. Kirk, I want to go back to what you call uh, your World Cup back in uh, 2010. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and you already mentioned it. This current U.S. batch of players is so young. They're the they're by far the youngest by a whole year. For a new, uh, not a new player, but a player making their World Cup debut, which applies to the vast majority of who we expect to be on the plane to Qatar, what is that experience like and what kind of advice would you provide for a player that might be dealing with those nerves or those expectations, especially if we are expecting the U.S. to go, quote-unquote, 1-1-1 one, one, one in the group stage? That's what I kind of love so much about this U.S. men's national team. It's uh, how naive they are. They don't know any better. They've not felt the pressures of world football per se as a whole. Um, nobody expects a lot out of them. I mean, when you're a young player and you come into a national team setup, there are rules, there are codes of conduct, there are certain things you have to do or have to say or have to be around veteran players. The they, hierarchy, yeah, right? They've yeah. not had that. So don't, they don't know any better. In this Lord of the Flies world, they are the powers of be. So that's what they know in their little world. And they – it's almost like 2002 for the U.S. men's national team. Everything was so fresh, so new, and we're happy to be here that you, you leaned upon that. Well, 2006 was a different story for those guys because all of a sudden there were expectations on that group. There's not a lot of expectations on this group because their expectation was to get to the World Cup, but now it's just like, hey, can we get out of this group phase? Um, they've got interesting players in that in a tournament setting with their age and their traits, how explosive they can be on a – uh, in transition um, and how oftentimes during World Cup qualifying, they've shown that they could be a dangerous team at home. You always you say know. international football, international soccer, too, is a very young man's it game. It is. So you're going to have three games in about 10 days that could play in their fla- uh, favor. It, just them being so naive, I think, could be beneficial to them. Not knowing really what's in store and just kind of living the moment could be good for them. I, I'm, I wonder if, like, playing devil's advocate, you might also – if they do go out, we might look back on this and question, like, did they need some more veteran leadership? Because they are wildly young. Yeah, you know? listen. You don't want to be wildly old, but, you know, wildly young, I think. There's a balance, right? Yeah. And and we talk about how green this team is, Kyle. Um, players that have not really cemented themselves in, in you know, international football or, or at the club levels for that. Yeah, you know, like, we got guys at big clubs, but not. Right. Well, do you know mm-hmm. who the greenest team this setup is? It's Greg yeah, Berhalter. Greg Berhold, I mean, you got guys that are at Dortmund, that are Chelsea, that were at Barcelona, not Milan, like the highest of, of places that maybe haven't cemented themselves. Greg Berhalter, with all due respect, was the head coach of the Columbus crew when he was given the keys to this Ferrari. That's it. Just doesn't have that experience. Yeah. So, Seb, uh, Herc talks about these green players, and the team in North America that might have the least amount of experience at the World Cup is Canada, making their long-awaited return to the World Cup. What is your expectation for Canada? I think the uh, fact that Alfonso Davies is healthy for the World Cup, I know he had that brief injury scare, is a, a big lift for them. So Canada making their return to the World Cup, what what will be a quote-unquote good World Cup for them in a, in a tough group that has Belgium and Croatia in it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really the story with Canada. It's just the brutal nature of their group. They were a pot four team, and at the end of qualifying, had a chance to be a pot three team. But when you're a pot four team, you're just going to get good opposition. Uh, Morocco's not going to be easy. And then Croatia and Belgium are... I like their group. You do? I do like their group. So to me, okay, well, let's, let's see why. Here's what I see when I see Belgium and Croatia. I see two teams that are capable of, like, semifinal runs, but also bombing out, right? I think Belgium is... One of those teams that, like, we've been waiting on this golden generation. They're now older than the golden generation. I wasn't that impressed with now them. Now it's the, the golden European. years generation. Exactly. So, so maybe there's a collapse there, but still, on talent, you're taking them. Yeah, on, 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 on paper, on paper, Croatia and, and Belgium, you would say, are fighting out for one and two, and no doubt. Right. You know, Morocco could make some waves, but you saw Morocco against the U.S. and how abysmal that yeah, was. They were terrible. Ziyech is their best player. Doesn't want anything to do with, you know, the Moroccan national team. Yeah. You see how long in the tooth Belgium are, Croatia are. Their best years are probably behind them. You saw what happened to them. Yeah, Croatia was good at Euros. Uh, they, were know, good they, took, in, they were good in 2014, and yeah. then they were good in 2018, and they were decent in Euros. Decent in Euros. You know, yeah. same thing with Belgium. But they're, they're long in the tooth, and, and expectations are heavy. At some point it's in the, the international game, these it, old guys are going to fall well, off. We saw it with all the big teams, and Croatia and Belgium are two teams that have not fallen off well, yet. Well, if there's one team in CONCACAF that I think is just made for a group setting, it's Canada. Okay. And John Herdman, I think, is brilliant. He 
he ate the best managers in CONCACAF up. Tata Martino, Greg Berhalter ate him up. Was it really like tactical genius or it was, was it just like it was sitting dudes back and hitting no, the No, it was tactical because it, he went toe-to-toe with – he didn't go counter. He went toe-to-toe. He high-pressed the Mexican national team in Azteca, and that midfield was non-existent. I actually think he gave Greg Berhalter the blueprint for how to beat Mexico in Cincinnati. And then he did the same thing twice. You know, he's like, hey, the U.S. men's national team is not creative enough. Let me sit in a low block and force them to come at us, and we'll just pick them apart on the counter. And they did that. So they have these young, explosive players. We'll stack you in the midfield who's got good vision, good passing. Uh, Alfonso Davies that could play anywhere in the field, and you have to be weary of him. Uh, Jonathan David, that is a nine, who finishes like a nine, but he's got good enough game where he's kind of like a nine and a half when he drops in and kind of play makes a little. And then you have Kyle Laren who's just an out-and-out goal scorer. They've got players everywhere that can hurt you, and they're very hard defensively. They've got decisive players. Like, if you think about, like, one-on-one players in CONCACAF, Davies, Tejan Buchanan, near near the top of that list, right? They can break you down big time, and they can create plays at any level, and I think we'll see that in the World Cup. And then they have finishers, and they have two of them. Like, they have not just arguably the best nine in CONCACAF, two of the best nines uh, in Laren and Jonathan David. So... If those guys finish, like I always say this, and it's very oversimplifying, and if we just said this, then there would be no Football Americas, there would be no World Soccer Talk. If you finish your chances, like you win games. And I think Canada in that regard, if you look at the front-line players of all the CONCACAF teams, you say, who am I going to bet on to to take, to not just take, but create chances? Yeah. I think it is Canada. I, I like their team. Um, I, I just – I cannot – I can't look at that group and say, like, oh, I see them getting through. I could see – how they might pull an upset and get through. But if you ask me to bet my money on it, no, I don't think I'll be top two in that group. But it's, yeah. a, it's a really good team. And, and your point about Herdman is, is – Yeah. Is yeah. The only issue with them is they're not very deep. So you can count on 11-12 and you could say, all right, if they can stay intact, they've got a good opportunity. Do something special. But this is the first time in, what, 36 years? Yep. 1986 yep. was the it was the last time they were in a World last Cup. Last and only, right? Last and only. So – uh, it's going to be something special for them. Do I think they can do something special? Special being get out of the group? Yes. I want to ask you both about Football Americas because you guys will be in Qatar, from my understanding, uh, during the World Cup. Just kind of tell people what your plans are out there for uh, your show, your coverage of the World Cup, and actually being in the host nation for the tournament. So we will be actually flying out next Tuesday, getting to Qatar next Wednesday, which is the like 16th or 17th, right? And we'll basically uh, take a – we'll do our show on Thursday the 17th from Qatar. We'll take a couple days to kind of like get the lay of the land, get some interviews. Uh, and then starting on Sunday before the first game of the World Cup, we will be going live every single day on ESPN+. Plus For almost all the games, it'll be at the same – or all the days, it'll be at the same time. It'll be 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific, live on ESPN+. Plus. So – as soon as the last game of the day is over and the broadcaster that you're watching goes to commercial, you tag over to ESPN Plus. We'll be live. We'll do no commercials. We'll be going for, I don't know. They told us it was a half hour show when we started. Then it became an hour. And now it's like an hour and a half. Yeah. So who knows how long it'll truly go. Um, but we'll be doing that every day with like one exception, which is when I think Mexico and Argentina play in the second game of the day, not the last game of the day. We will actually move the show up so that we can react to that game immediately um, after it happens. So really our work, our role will be when USA, Mexico, the CONCACAF teams finish playing, we're going live on plus and of course we'll be all over, you know, social digital platforms for ESPN as well. But um, our concentration is going to be the CONCACAF teams, USA, Mexico specifically. um, And we're going to be doing shows every single day. Of course it's available on ESPN plus, but podcast as well. So uh, I have looked at the schedule. There's not a lot of like blank spaces. No, no, (laughs) People, I mean, listen, it's incredible how the show's taken off, but people don't realize like the, uh, the efforts that ESPN are making. Um, we're, we don't have rights, and we're going up against a network that does yeah. have rights, or networks, networks that do have rights, I should say. Uh, and, and they believe so much in the product that they're flying us out to Qatar and, and the whole works, studio space, you know, the, the, the whole month there, do what you guys do. Uh, every day of the week to bring people the content that they want because they believe in this show. It started out as a niche product and, it, and it's grown. It started out as something like a passion project. We see the need for this American soccer show, American football show, but 
what does that mean? You know, an American football show. They're much more than just the U.S. men's national team. There's they're just much more than, you know, the domestic leagues here in the States or around the States. And I think we've proven that that concept. And so far, it's taken us to where we are now, you know, on the, on the cusp of Qatar. I think also for us, if you think about kind of the story of the show, we started in March of 2021, you know, effectively the beginning of qualifying, right? Or the, kind of the, where we really focused in on the, on the end and, and the run of qualification there. And I, I feel like the tournament here, the World Cup now, is kind of like the end of that first chapter, right? Like we have been building up to this and our numbers have been growing and, you know, the, the interest in the show has been growing. But there's never been, nothing like a World Cup. You know, you just have so many eyeballs. And so I think for anybody in the soccer space, I'm sure like World Soccer Talk, you know, anybody who's listening who, who also works in this knows that, you know, in, in soccer, certainly in American soccer, you know, we, we fight for numbers. And then every four years comes this, you know, fire hose of a World Cup where like everybody's watching and it's your big chance. So um, for us, it feels like a really big opportunity, not just because of, you know, all the investment from ESPN, uh, but also just because it's it's a critical moment in the show's history. Like this is our first World Cup and this is the one that we've been building up to. And all the narratives are going to pay off here. All the, is Greg Berhalter the right guy? Is Tata Martino the right guy? Was leaving Chicharito at home? All that is going to pay off in the next month. And like, I'm really looking forward to, it's, kind of, it's like the end of a, you know, a, a season of a television show. Like they, they got to wrap it up now. We got to see how it concludes, you know, before we kick off the next season um, next year. So um, I, I'm really kind of pumped to see what the writers have in store in that regard. Like, how is it going to play out? And how are we going to react you know, in, live, in live time? So before I let you guys go, I just have a couple of very quick questions, yes or no questions. I want to ask you about the CONCACAF teams, the World Cup. Uh, does the United, do all the CONCACAF teams, do any of them get out of the group? Uh, let's start with the United States. Do they get out of uh, their group with Wales, England, and Iran? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. On and, goal uh, difference, huh? On goal difference. How about uh, Mexico? I think Mexico's with Poland, Argentina, and Saudi Arabia. Yes. No. Ooh. No. Now and that then, might be my my pessimism as, wow. a, as a Mexico fan. I'm probably going to every World Cup not thinking they're going to get through, but they've got me through every World Cup since 1994, and you're going to say no this go around, dude. I just I don't feel it. I don't feel the vibe around the team. I don't trust the coach. I don't like the players that aren't there. You said yes or no. I said no. Right. I, I don't feel good about it. Okay. And then Costa Rica, I believe they're in that uh, Germany, Spain, Japan and group. Spain. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> as as much as I would love to think they could surprise, they we talk about teams that are long in the two. Yeah, they, they, yeah. I, I know that I know the table at the end of qualifying didn't suggest this because they were tied on points with the U.S. But I I think Costa Rica for me was pretty clearly, you know, fourth in a three horse race. If we want to put it that way. There was the top three, and then there was Costa Rica. So I think they'll really not struggle at the World Cup announcement. Right. Then and, and then the uh, last Concacaf team where I talked about them Canada in that uh, in that tough group. Do it, do it. <laughs> Comprometete. I'm gonna be honest. I think Canada has more opportunity, has more of a chance to go through than the U.S. <laughs> but I, I'm gonna take. I, I, I promise you. Really, at that point, banking on like a big team dropping the ball, which is usually the case in the World Somebody Cup. Somebody will do it. That's yeah. usually the case in the World Cup. So I, I will say they they are my surprise team. Yes, I I could see the U.S. Easily not advancing. They are 50-50 for me in that group. I will say yes, just because I've mentioned goal differential. I think that could be a factor. So I think that's how they go in. But yeah, I think Canada is, is the one team uh, in CONCACAF that will surprise the most. Okay. I say no. I, I don't think they're going to get through. I think they'll be competitive. I think they'll play great, but I don't think they'll be I may change my mind about the U.S. now that I've been thinking about it. But <laughs> I'll, keep it I'll keep it this way right now. Kyle on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, last question, which team actually wins the whole World Cup? Brazil. Brazil, you said Brazil? Yeah. yeah. Brazil. I mean, just, I know this is yes or no, but just look at their lines. Look at how star studded that team is. It's like the dream team. Um, and I think Neymar right now is the best player in the really? world. Yes, I do. It's I funny how, like, a year ago, what would you have said about Neymar? You would not have said that. You just said he's not even in the top 10, <laughs> no, right? No. Things change quickly. Yeah, they do change quickly. A year ago, I mean, in the World Cup, he is the top player. Right now, you can make a case that Erling Holland is the best player in the world. But right now in the World Cup, I think he's the best player in it. And I know people are going to say Messi, 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 which is fine and great. But I think Neymar is, is the man right now. Yeah. Gosh, I think Vinny might be 
super dangerous for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Richarlison, I mean, they've got a ridiculous team. Yeah. Any way you slice it. Yeah. I, so always the favorites have been France and Brazil, right? And I feel like Brazil's a, a pretty easy default pick. So I'll go with them too, just because of the injury issues for France. Although, um, you know, who is it? Joamania and Rabio is your backups. Uh, Camavinga as well as your backups when you lose. France them. is in my three. Uh, actually, it. Argentina. It's Brazil, Argentina. It, it's coming. It's coming away from Europe. I think. Really? Yeah. That's a bold. That's a bold prediction. Is it? Yeah. I mean, just because <laughs> Europe has been so dominant in the World Cup. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and Brazil has let down. I feel like in recent tournaments. I mean, yeah. Brazil 2014, last round. You're, you're going. To you're going with the history of tournaments, and if that was the case, you wouldn't have picked Mexico not to go through. <laughs> yeah. I just don't know, man. I just something about Brazil is is still out there for me. But make a paper, decision. Yeah, I'll, I'll take them <laughs> because to me it's Brazil, France, and then everybody else falls into a hodgepodge. And I so can, you think France has opportunity to repeat? Not, no, Conte. Not, not not without the injuries. No, okay, they would have been there, but right. I'll, I'll take Brazil because it's the easy pick. You got a dark horse? Because uh, that's what I struggle with. Do I have like, a dark well, horse? Pick, pick a team. That's yeah, not Denmark, Brazil or France. Wow, you and horse. Frank LeBeouf. Frank LeBeouf had. You want us to know somebody had Canada? Frank LeBeouf on yesterday's semifinals. Season, he had Canada Denmark as a semifinal. That wouldn't be bad. Canada. Yeah, we actually uh, we asked a lot of people ourselves uh, who their dark horse pick was. I think Denmark, I believe, was the most popular pick in that regard. So, Herc, you're not alone in that. Uh, but uh, Seven Herc, I really want to thank you for uh, for doing this. And like you guys already mentioned, Football America's live every day during the World Cup after all the games, except for those rare exceptions. So, Seb, Burke, thank you all for doing this. Hope you all have a great rest of the day uh, watching the U.S. men's national team roster reveal. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it.